we have a lot of history on this, Maslow, Erickson, Skinner. Uh, a sense of compassion, I'm sorry, competence is necessary to develop positive self-esteem. Kids have to be able to do something well. Make sure a kid's successful at something. I don't care if it's tying shoes. Uh, I was so taken today when I got here for the setup. Uh, everybody had it all organized. I didn't have anything to do. So I walked outside, and I was just watching um, a few folks, a few of the adults. They may have been counselors, social workers. I'm not sure. Uh, watching over the kids on the playground here, interacting with them. And I saw three boys, and they were shooting hoops right here, just outside the window. And the smallest one got a basket. He was so excited. The first thing he did, he looked at the adults. And he looked at the two big kids. Two big kids didn't necessarily respond because they can get baskets more easily. The both adults here were so appropriate. Good job, fantastic, ah, oh, way to go. And you know what they did? They praised a step. They praised a small success. He missed the next one. But he got the one after that again, looked over, praised. Make sure he wouldn't be here unless there were a reason, would he? So making those two baskets today may have made his entire week. So we always make sure kids are good at something. It's very, very important. And, um, we want to praise progress. They don't have to do everything, uh, you know, don't have kids feel that unless, please, they do something perfectly, behave perfectly, get an A in something, that then they've been successful. It's one step at a time. What do they say in Alcoholics Anonymous? It's kind of one day at a time. And some members will say, heck, sometimes it's one minute at a time. But every minute counts. It rolls into that, doesn't it, OK? Um, Every student needs an activity or a hobby. We have a long history of research showing that. And uh, Werner and Strauss and their, or Smith in their original research, the earlier research, wrote of a girl who was up in her attic. She's very physically abused at home. And she went into her attic. And she had a hobby there where she was laying out, you know, drawing, coloring, laying out different types of designs of another, a boy, who was up there and he had saved his money and bought some small trains and he had set up his own little train tracks and everything else. And that was what kept them sane, giving them an activity, a hobby, which can be distraction. Please don't feel that every activity for children has to be driving them to soccer practice or football. Well, I think we have lost the magnificent art of bicycle riding. When I was growing up on Long Island, uh, they built a school behind us, just had to go around the fence or over the fence. And I remember some summer afternoons of just going and lying in that field. Now, darn it, nobody to play with. Darn it, nothing to do, except lie there and be myself and think or not think. Um, that's OK. That's healthy. It really, really is. So I don't want us to feel that for kids to have an activity, it has to be something that uh, adults can schedule. All kids need a social network. They need positive friends. They need hope in the future. This is what creates resilience. This is what keeps kids from resorting to violence. They need healthy friends. They need to see that the future is good. Otherwise, unhealthy resilience, because they have no future. They have nothing to look forward to. So they join a gang. They get in with the antisocial groups, and they get into destructive survival behaviors. have uh, a story I want to read you there, too. And this was about something that happened to me some years ago. I was up at a conference at Columbia University in New York. And if you've ever been on in that area of the city, um, it's pretty violent, the subway. It's, it's, it's pretty close to uh, violent neighborhoods. And it's a pretty scary area as you get on the subway to come back. 
On a trip to New York City, I rode the subway downtown after a day-long university conference. At 4 o'clock, families were leaving museums and filing into train cars, hoping to beat the rush hour crowds. Seats were full of sleepy children, their parents holding gift shop bags and chatting about the evening meal. So we had a lot of tourists in there too, New York City tourists taking the subway. <clears throat> the doors opened at a stop and six young teens raced into the car, shoving each other and laughing loudly, clearly following a preordained plan. These guys had done this before. These boys placed hands deeply in their pockets and they spread out quickly amongst the seated families. I mean, it was a packed subway car. Shocking profanities filled the air as they forced their bodies within inches of individual passengers. After mocking her shrunken appearance, one boy spit in an older woman's face. I was there, honest. Traveling alone, she cried out in shock. She lowered her head into her trembling hands and sobbing, sobbing. She didn't know what to do. No one was able to protect her as the youth continued from one person to the next, screaming hostilities and insults at adults and children alike. Arms tightly fix, fixing sons' and daughters' bodies to their own, parents focused their eyes on the floor, avoiding confrontation. One teen shouted that the group had guns to kill all of us. Like kids had their hands in their pockets. We didn't know if they had guns or not. They said they did. You believe them. One teen shouted that they had guns, right? Taking them seriously, we cowed in our seats. As the sounds of shrieking children erupted, the boys laughed hysterically. They shouted obscenities, placed their faces inches away from individual passengers, defying each of us to confront them. One youth pushed his hand violently against a father holding a crying toddler, daring him to fight. Face taut with anger, the man lowered his head onto his weeping daughter's shoulder. Like oppressive humidity, our fear permeated the air. It was scary. An eternity passed in those minutes. <clears throat> Finally, the doors flew open at the next stop. Leaving store bags on seats, parents grabbed children and yanked them onto the platform outside. A teenage traveler put his arm around the older woman, still in shock, and guided her quickly along. Smiling broadly at their conquest and shouting abuse, the six youth remained aboard the subway for their next victims. <clears throat> the doors closed. The only ones on it were those six teenagers, and the train moved on. Frozen, none of us moved until jolted by the house of the crying children. Racing to the platform conductor, several adults heatedly reported the assaults, the threats, and asked him to call authorities to remove the teens from the train car before they terrorized others. He shook his head. Don't bother yourself. This stuff goes on all the time. Those kids know they'll be dead at 20 anyway. This is their way of trying to take the rest of us with them. And as we watched in disbelief, he walked away. That is unhealthy resilience. Those kids, I hate to say it, he was right, believed that they would be dead at 20. So why worry about it? Why not get a kick if they could? And this is what we find when we have kids with unhealthy types of peers. <clears throat>